Right, I would invite you to stand as we read our scripture today, which comes from the book of Matthew, uh, the second chapter, verses 13 through 23. Hear the word of the Lord. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, good morning and Happy New Year, everyone. And as Jeremy said, Merry seventh day of Christmas. Uh, There is actually a reason why there is a song, 12 Days of Christmas. For a long time, I thought that it was just a fun song that we sing, but no, there actually are 12 days of Christmas, and today is the seventh day. It is a fallacy in our culture that we only celebrate Christmas on one day. It's something that we should change. The gift of Christmas is too good for one day, right? And uh, it's fun to have a new tradition of celebrating uh, the birth of Christ in our lives, uh, the return of Jesus as we prepare for uh, and the 12 days that follow uh, Christmas and then the 11 days after that. It's another great reason, too, for us to celebrate Advent. If you start celebrating Christmas uh, in November, then by the time December 25th rolls around, you are sort of feeling like this is the end and it needs to be over. Right? We were at my sister's house on Christmas Day, and she informed my brother-in-law that he was going to wake up uh, early before the kids got up and put away all the Christmas decorations because she was finished with them. And sometimes we feel that way. But if you celebrate Advent and you prepare and, and wait for uh, the arrival of Jesus on Christmas Day, then it's not uh, a, a difficult thing to rest in that for um, the 11 days that follow. And as we read this story of Jesus' arrival, or that, that thereafter, um, as Jesus' parents were traveling from place to place, I was challenged by this uh, image this week uh, as I was spending time in prayer, uh, that Jesus and his family were immigrants. They were migrating from place to place. Uh, They didn't have a place to call home and settle in. Uh, They were moving from town to town to flee horrendous and horrific situations that they experienced where they were They were fleeing a tyrant who wanted to kill Jesus. And as I was reflecting on this journey that we just read about, that Joseph and Mary and the new baby Jesus took, I couldn't help but think about perhaps all of the people along the way who were there to help Jesus, those that uh, offered him uh, maybe cold water or a nourishing meal or a place to shelter down, a place to feed uh, the animals that they were traveling with. But all of those along the way that we don't read about in Scripture necessarily, but you know had to have been there in order to help Jesus and his family as they traveled from place to place. We today in our culture talk a lot about 
immigrants. Uh, particularly in our area of the country. We see immigrants ev- each and every day. And this image for me is a reminder of what we are instructed in Hebrews chapter 13, where we are instructed to show hospitality towards strangers. For you never know, as the scriptures tell us, when you might be entertaining an angel. Those people who helped Mary and Joseph and Jesus along the way couldn't have dreamed in their wildest imaginations that they were offering their aid to Jesus. But nonetheless, they noticed him. They were present to this family, and they leveraged their abilities and influence and resources to care for their neighbor. This is important for us to remember as the people of God that our primary concern as the people of God, is to trust in what we have been instructed, to love God with our whole being, and then to love our neighbor as our self, even those who are only our neighbor for a short time. Also, as I read through this passage in Matthew this week, I was uh, amazed at the responsiveness of Joseph, Uh, The Holy Spirit, uh, through the presence of an angel, led Joseph step by step on this journey to keep Jesus safe and secure. And the angel shows up to him several times and, first of all, tells him to stay with Mary and to name Jesus Jesus and to care for him as his own. Uh, He responds to him and the angel tells uh, him to leave Uh, Bethlehem for uh, Jesus's safety and then tells him when it's safe to go back. And I was reading through that. And of course, this is a very unique event, right? This uh, is the birth of Jesus we're talking about there. uh, This isn't ordinary daily life. However, the same Holy Spirit is present in our lives and desires to lead us so that we are responsive to where God is calling us to go, to live such lives that we are being responsive to the Holy Spirit. That is my prayer for us for 2023, that we would be a community of people who are responding to the Holy Spirit uh, as, as often as possible. And so with that in mind, I want to move into the sort of reflection portion of our service. But before we do that, I want to offer uh, this prayer um, as a community um, for the Holy Spirit to move in this place. Let's pray these words together. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that in hearing we may also trust in your ways. Through Christ our Lord, amen. What a year 2022 has been. I I know that for many of us, we have experienced significant things in 2022. Some of them we are elated about. Some of them we're kind of on the fence about. Some of them we might wish have not happened. But 2022 has been a year that has been full. And for me, I think it is extremely important for us to spend time in reflection. This is something that we do as a community, as a spiritual practice, that we believe in uh, the taking time to examine and reflect on what God has been doing in our lives. Um, what are the moments in which God has been leading us and we've been responsive? And maybe what are the moments where we've lost our responsiveness, where we've been distracted and And then thinking about the future as well, where God might be leading us and how we might respond to what God is doing in the new year. And so today, I want to take a moment and look back on the year that was 2022 for us. And before we do that, we have uh, instructions on doing this in Scripture. Uh, There are many times where people are instructed to remember 
right? Remember uh, the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the way that God has been faithful through the generations, that God has been faithful to you, to your parents, to their parents, and their parents, and so on and so forth. And so we read this often to take time to reflect. But in Isaiah chapter 63, here is what the scriptures say. I will tell of the kindness of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. Today, my heart is full for all of the ways in which we as a community can tell of the compassion and many kindnesses of God. And I want to take a minute this morning and reflect on those. Our vision at Journey is simple. What we aspire to be is pretty straightforward. It's a sentence that we actually say every time that we are gathered, that we are a community of people following the way of Jesus and learning to be present. So there's a couple of things to draw the significance of in this statement. First of all, we have we and community. There is no I in journey, right? It's about we. It's a community. We are a community of people who are desiring to journey together, to share together, to rejoice together, to mourn together, to comfort one another, to notice each other and inspire one another to notice our neighbors. Uh, in, in next beginning next week, we are going to begin a new campaign. We're calling it Journey to 50. For a while now, as a part of our prayer emphasis, we have been praying for 50. Uh, we started by praying for 50 people to join in in the work that God is doing here. And then we were reminded by one of our sweet saints that why would we stop at 50? So we added a plus to the 50. We decided that 50 was not enough to um, pray for, that we were going to not put a limit on uh, what God would do. And so next week, from next week up until uh, the season beginning uh, with Ash Wednesday, the season of Lent, we are going to be in a campaign to... uh, Join in with 50 plus other people and invite them to join in in the work that God is doing here at Journey. It's going to be our emphasis and our prayers and our expectations and our hopes that we would expand as a community, not to get accolades or toot our own horn, but because we have more work to do. And we believe that God is calling us to uh, more presence in our community. And in order to accomplish that, we're going to have to have some new friends join in. Many hands make light, make light work, right? Uh, and so I tell my kids every time it's time to clean up the house uh, is that if you would all help, it would go much faster. And then they sit there with their arms crossed and I end up cleaning up. So... Uh, but we're going to not do that here. We're going to join in with everyone and, and gain new friends. Uh, we are a community of people. Right? We are people. People are impressed with the image of God. God's goodness is somewhere within people. But people also are imperfect, right? We are bearers of the image of God, but we also are imperfect. And so we, instead of acting like that's not true, we confess that. Every time we gather, we confess that, we, that perfection is a myth, right? And that's not only for us so that we don't consider ourselves perfect, but also so that we don't expect others to be perfect, And what unites us, what matters most, is that we are people who are completely dependent on God's grace, not on our ability to do things right or on our performance or what we can get right, but on God's grace. And that is what unites us and lead us forward. We are people following the way of Jesus. We've said it over and over again that we want to be a community that trusts in Jesus above all else. 
But there are a lot of influences in our lives. There are a lot of things that seek to try to capture our attention, to divert our eyes. And we want to be able to recognize when those things are sneaking in and to trust Jesus above everything else, to trust the way of Jesus above everything else. And finally, we want to learn to be present. We want to be here now as much as possible. This moment is such a gift that we have. It is a gift that we oftentimes take for granted, but we have a device for that here at Journey as well. One of our prayers is that we would not take for granted, right? We don't want to take a moment for granted. We want to be fully present right here and right now and fully present and responsive to where the Holy Spirit is leading us, to whom the Holy Spirit is leading us, and uh, to do the things that the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. We want to experience the new wonders of God that are here all around us now. That's the type of community that we aspire to be. But we don't want to just sit here in our building and be those people. We want to also have work to do. We want to also contribute to uh, the kingdom of God. And so our device for that is that we want to leverage our abilities and influence and resources to bless our neighbor. So first of all, to leverage. Leveraging means to do the work that God has called us to do. Right, we don't want to keep these things for ourselves. Right? As a children, we learned the song, hide the light under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Right? We want to let God shine in our lives and through our lives. And that's what leveraging is all about. It's about the work of the kingdom. And we want to leverage our abilities and our influence and our resources to bless our neighbors. All of us have abilities and influence and resources. There's not one person who has an insignificant amount of any of those things. Now, if you compare them to others, you might see some what you uh, could identify or call an insufficiency. If your expectation is that you are perfect, then perhaps you might find yourself lacking in these areas. But none of the, neither of those two things are true according to the kingdom of God. God has given all of us a tremendous and unique amount of abilities, influence, and resources. And when we learn to do the work of the kingdom of God in the scope of those abilities and influence and resources, then the kingdom of God is glorified and what is true comes to light. And then to do all of these things in order to bless our neighbors. Jesus said it pretty plainly when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He responded, love the Lord your God with everything that you are and love your neighbor as yourself. Your commitment to the kingdom of God is measured directly by how much you are willing to love your neighbor. And so with all of that in mind, we set out in 2022 to be as responsive as possible to where God is calling us. And I want to go through some of the things uh, as a bit of a recap. But the theme for this recap is small but mighty. Everybody say small but mighty. I, as I reflected and thought about these things, I took a moment to uh, offer thanks for the way in which God has worked in this community. I was amazed at how much God did in and through each and every single one of us as we have sought to leverage our abilities, influence, and resources to bless our neighbor. So if you forgot, 2022 began with a move. 
I don't know how many of you have tried to move a church, but even to move a small church is a big undertaking. And quite honestly, I don't know how in the world we were able to accomplish it, except for um, that God provided in the midst of that move. This move was four years in the making, a four plus year dream that we had waited upon. Doors opened, doors closed, and God was faithful to lead us all the way as we patiently, for the most part, there were some moments of impatience, I'm sure, but patiently waited on God to lead us to a place where we could be good neighbors. And through after the pandemic and after some of those opening and closing doors, God proved himself to be faithful and we ended up here. Now, this isn't a perfect place, right? We we say that perfection is a myth. So we admit that this place isn't perfect, but we've made it a home. We found some critters uh, in the process, some uh, dried bats. I've, I've eaten a lot of dried things. I was not willing to try a dried bat. But we found this guy uh, here. We began the work, if you can remember, of all the work that went into transforming this space. And you'll notice here that this isn't one person doing the work. These are many people who are contributing to the beauty of this space. Some of them are not even tall enough to hold a hammer, but yet they were here and working all the while, creating a space for people to come and to worship, to be present to God and to one another, to have a space where we could offer prayers and collectively discern the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And this is uh, one of my favorite pictures from the day, our opening day, um, that we celebrated in February. And that was just the beginning of the year, right? That just takes us to February. So once we were able to settle in as best as I can figure. Now, I'm going to give you some uh, statistics here. I'm going to give you some figures. And I want to do that with a bit of a disclaimer. I always try to tell the most true numbers when it comes time to telling numbers. Uh, sometimes pastors can be like fishermen, right, where they're showing you the size of their fish and it, you know, it gets bigger with every time they tell the story. But these numbers are uh, an attempt to be as accurate as possible uh, to explain how God has been working in a small but mighty way. Uh, so the numbers are not, you, you can't uh, etch them in stone but they are as accurate as we possibly could determine. Uh, There might be inflation on the milk that you buy this afternoon, but not on these numbers. They are accurate and real, okay? So uh, we spent a collective 600-plus hours of service in our community, 600-plus hours through Biter Bites and movie on the wall and meet the teacher. We spent 600 plus hours being good neighbors. To me, that is incredible. We spent an estimated 260 hours praying for our community. 260 hours in prayer for our neighbors, faithfully praying for the needs of those in our community who desire to share them and depend on someone who they don't know or haven't met to carry those needs. And we've done that to the tune of 260 plus hours We have hosted several different 
uh, events where we've uh, branched out of our own congregation and invited others, whether it be our partners at St. Mark or some of the other churches in our denomination with Ash Wednesday and Pentecost Sunday and Christmas Eve, we uh, spent time worshiping together to be a faithful witness to our neighbors that it's not about just us, but it is about the whole entire body of Christ. We baptized four people. We baptized four people uh, this past year. We gave away approximately 300 snow cones this year <laughs> as we did at Meet the Teacher Night and our um, homecoming Sunday and events that we put on for our neighbors. We uh, set up uh, several days of teacher appreciation for the staff at McKinsey Elementary where they could pause during their day of caring for students and go get a little treat that says there are people uh, who work and, and live right down the street from you who care deeply for you and appreciate the work that you have done. And if you have paid attention to some of the struggles of teachers as of late, uh, you will know how uh, uplifting it is for us and them to be writing a different story that says the community and the school can be in partnership with one another. Now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about something that maybe we can't necessarily see on a daily basis, but is important for us to remember. I want to give you some people stats, right? some stats about people. So one of the emphasis, emphases, emphasi, not sure which one of those is the appropriate one of this year, is that we have been devoted, and when I say we, I mean primarily Jeremy, has been devoted to uh, connecting with our neighbors by utilizing technology, both to uh, connect with them just on a personal level, um, but also to uh, put out information and um, connecting with people through social media and any sort of technology through um, our church center app and all those different things. Uh, also to communicate with people about the community events that we do, whether that be serving in the community or a movie on the wall, different things like that. When we had to cancel one of the movies on the wall, we were able to send out a text, and that text went out to everyone um, who had signed up for it, and it's a very effective way to communicate us utilizing technology. So small but mighty, right? We have, over this past year, had 162 people create profiles for communication through our uh, use of technology. 162 people. That's pretty incredible, right? Uh, those are people who are interested in the work that our church is doing, um, and, um, and some of them who are asking for that information to consider joining in with that. Over this past year, we have had 60 plus first time guests. 60 plus first time guests. I would imagine that that's pretty close to the total of guests that we have had in the four years prior um, that, I, that I have been a part of Journey and who knows um, how far year, how many years before that. 60 plus first time guests. That's more, if you can do the math quickly, that's more than one guest per weekend right, um, that has joined in um, here in worship with us. Um, in addition to those people stats and trying to utilize technology, we, um, we launched an online gathering. Um, there was a time a couple of weeks ago where we, of course, had people from Texas and Dallas, but um, there were some people from Ohio that were joining us, some people from Kentucky, and uh, we just need somebody uh, in Europe or South America to join in, and then we can slap the label worldwide on there. 
uh, or international. But through that online gathering, we have been providing a space for people to join in worship. Some of them don't attend church on Sunday for whatever reason, or they have a moment during the week where they just need a time to center on the presence of Jesus, on the calling and leadership of the Holy Spirit. And they're able to do that through our online gathering. Uh, we have been able to provide gifts for our, some of our homebound people as we have connected with them. We've aided people through difficult life situations as they have faced struggling and difficult days. All of these things are telling the story of the compassion and many kindnesses of God. That's what we have been doing all year, is working to respond to where God is leading us. And while we might be a small in numbers congregation, God is doing great things. And that's important for us to recognize. I wanted to close this time by reading this passage of scripture. I read this scripture this week. If you can remember back to Christmas Eve, if you were able to join in with us, uh, we declared that salvation has a name, right? And that name is Jesus, that God has been working since the very beginning of time to empower his people to live according to his ways. That's personified in Jesus, but it's the same work that God has been doing, uh, that God did through Jesus, and that God will continue to do. So listen to this scripture as a way for us to consider 2023. Paul says this, he says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, the, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. In 2023, I want us to focus in on being a people who embody the mystery of God, who see that divine, mysterious spark and bear witness to that in creation and in the lives of our neighbors, that as many as possible might know of the goodness of God. And that come the end of 2023 or the beginning of 2024, when we're sitting here talking about all of the things that God has done, that we would be able to point to this mysterious presence that has led us all along to places that we could have never dreamed of going on our own to the glory of God.